Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third annual FinTech Conference. For those that uh, don't know me, I'm Pat Harker. I'm President and CEO here in the Philly Fed. So I have two orders of business today. The first is to welcome everyone here. So that's done. I can check that off my list. Welcome. Uh, and second is to introduce our keynote speaker, Chicago Fed President Charlie, Charles Evans. Before I, but before I get to that, I want to set the stage for this conference. So a few years ago, uh, we consolidated the Philly Fed's longstanding expertise in all things consumer into a single entity, the Consumer Finance Institute. In its short existence, we've produced some really game-changing research, communications, and conferences under the CFI umbrella, including, of course, uh, this area of FinTech. So I want to congratulate Jalapa, Bob, and the whole team uh, at CFI for putting together a great roster and what looks like uh, another exceptional set of conversations about this ever-changing world of fintech. Now some of you are here for the first time and to you I say you won't be disappointed. Some of you have been with us before and to you I say I'm sorry because <laughs> while the field of fintech is constantly evolving, one of the underlying messages you'll hear from old fogies like me has stayed exactly the same. And that is this, in the grand scheme of humanity and technological advancement, what's happening today is no different than what's happened for millennia, as we find faster and better ways of doing things. What's different today, in my view, as we take this hammer of destructive creativity to the status quo, is simply how fast it's happening. So we've always had change, it's the speed. And that's really where these discussions today and tomorrow become so important. I know, I know, some of you have heard this from me a lot, a hundred times before maybe. I invoke the Iron Age and the Industrial Revolution and point out that prepaid cards were the fintech of an earlier, earlier era. But this time around, I've actually been thinking a lot about New Year's Eve of 1999. Not because of Y2K, though. Instead, because what I remember most about the lead-up to that momentous event, even during the countdown to midnight, is that there was, some, there was always someone, somewhere, insisting that we just simply calm down, right? Like those t-shirts say, keep calm. Uh, because technically, people would point out, irritatingly so sometimes, that the new millennium didn't start until 2001. And so, but when, when we think about the changes that we've gone through, we also recognize that change is just a constant in our lives. So I don't want to sound like one of those killjoys, uh, you know, one of those curmudgeons. We have to accept the fact that we're changing. But again, this change is coming at us very quickly. And that, I think, has serious implications, especially for areas and sectors that generally respond to change rather than initiate it, right? That is, the, the ones who just take the change instead of making it happen. So it's great to see we're having so many discussions about how we can navigate that transformation in everything from business partnerships to regulation, which means that in addition to welcoming everyone today, I want to thank you uh, as well. You are a vital part of this conversation, and I thank you for taking the time to be here. So turning to the second half of my mandate this morning, it's time to introduce my colleague from Chicago. You know, Chicago's known for many things, including pizza that East Coasters find dubious, Charlie. <laughs> and I'll let, the, I'll let the New Yorkers in the crowd battle that one out. Philly has absolutely no skin in that pizza war. Uh, we're all about cheesesteak, so that's us. But for an engineer like me, Chicago is something of a motherland, home to the nation's first elevated railway, the world's first Ferris wheel, and the place where the first atom was split which happened at the University of Chicago, where, in fact, Charlie once taught. But the one I really like is that in 1900, they actually reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So it would empty into the Mississippi River instead of Lake Michigan. This is relevant, in part, because when we talk about change and innovation, it's important to remember that some of history's cutting-edge feats are still with us today. These changes have long-lasting effects. And it's relevant in part because we're trying to tame the flow, the trying to tame the flow of a major river is exactly 
what I can imagine Charlie's job as chair of the Conference of Presidents is like. Now, so forget herding cats, for trying to herd 12 Fed presidents. Uh, so Charlie, oh, we owe Charlie a debt of gratitude and our sympathy as chair of the COP. But in all seriousness, I am very pleased that Charlie could be here today. Uh, he's a great economist, a great Fed president, a great ambassador for Chicago and for the whole district. Please help me welcome my colleague and my friend, President Charles Evans. Thanks, Pat. That was terrific. That was a wonderful introduction. I love being reminded of the uh, major controversies over Y2K, whether or not the millennia really started that year or not. You're right. Nobody was popular who raised that uh, type of issue. I don't think I've ever heard anybody refer to the Chicago River as a major river before. Sometimes it's thought of as more of a little bit of a canal, that type of thing. But uh, 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 I am delighted to be included in this uh, third annual FinTech conference and grateful to our host. Thank you so much, Jalapa, for uh, organizing this uh, fantastic uh, conference. Congratulations on three years. Um, grateful to our host, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and their conference, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and their conference partners, the Wharton School of uh, University of Pennsylvania, the Bank Policy Institute, the Brookings Institution, and the University of Cambridge. We think of FinTech as a new thing, uh, but I'd like to begin my talk by considering a historical example of financial technology and innovation from the time of the Fed's found founding. Countless innovations have been made in finance throughout history, and policymakers, including central bankers, have long grappled with how to foster financial innovation while at the same time ensuring the smooth operation of the financial system, as well as the stability of the broader macro economy. Uh, now, before I go on, let me remind everybody that I am part of the Federal Reserve System, and these are my own remarks and not those of anyone on the Federal Open Market Committee or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, in the early 1900s, many contemporaries saw the American payment system as slow and costly. This may ring a bell for those of you who have studied our payment system today. The debate in the early 1900s was different, of course, focusing on the processing of checks. Advocates for reform like to cite an example involving an actual check that was written out of a bank in Sag Harbor, Long Island, New York, and deposited in a bank in Hoboken, New Jersey, only 100 miles away. To receive the payment, the bank in Hoboken sent the check to its correspondent bank in New York City. But its correspondent didn't deal directly with the bank in Sag Harbor. So it sent the check along to another bank it partnered with. This continued, and in defiance of all sensibility, the check traveled to eight more banks in Boston, Tonawanda, Albany, Port Jefferson, Far Rockaway, back to New York City, Riverhead, and Brooklyn, before finally reaching its destination in Sag Harbor. The point of that 1,500-mile journey was to avoid fees imposed on check processing by working through existing bank relationships, but this caused a considerable delay. This is the problem of circuitous check routing, as it was known. I'm sure that FinTech innovators could have thought of many ways to improve on that system, which sounds inefficient and a little absurd. And as a policy, monetary policymaker, I can think of several things that might have concerned me. Ultimately, monetary policy is intended to create financial conditions that promote the ability of businesses and households to make good use of the economy's productive resources. Long gaps in the ability to access payments could impair liquidity for both households and businesses, as well as for the banks themselves. Circuitous check routing seemed like a sign of inefficiency in financial technology that could get in the way of the macroeconomy functioning at its full potential. Finally, a payment system with so many points of failure raised questions about how resilient it would be in times of stress. Now, scholars have debated whether examples like that 1,500-mile journey were cherry-picked by advocates for payment system reform. That may well have been the case. Nevertheless, scholars have also viewed the creation of the Fed as having substantially sped up check clearing and reduced the costs associated with it. One of the Fed's early key accomplishments was the creation of a national check clearing system. The national scope of this system largely eliminated the need to route checks around the country, at least for banks that were members of the Federal Reserve System, as they could simply use the nearest Federal Reserve branch. In addition, the Fed used a telegraph network to increase the speed of check clearing, 
particularly on the back end. Once the check was in the Fed's possession, it would credit the appropriate account and telegraph out that information. Telegraph, right? That's, that's technology. <laughs> Lastly, the Fed insisted on clearing of checks at par, something many banks had resisted as their business models depended on fees from check processing. Overall, in a short time from 1912 to 1918, check clearing sped up from an average of 5.3 days to 2.4 days and was largely at par. This was a major change. Clearly, the Fed has had a long-standing interest in improving the speed and resilience of the U.S. payments infrastructure. That interest continues, and the Fed is currently embarking on a major new initiative to deliver real-time payments. I will discuss this initiative, known as Fed Now, a little bit later. Notably, the Fed has not sought to displace existing payments infrastructure. At the time of its founding, for example, the Fed's check processing system continued to operate alongside private sector systems run by correspondent banks and clearinghouses. Today, the Federal Reserve continues to serve a prominent role in the payment system as a provider alongside private operators of financial services. Moreover, the Chicago Fed has had a long-standing role in leading Federal Reserve System initiatives in payment services. Staff in Chicago manage the system's customer relations and support office and oversee FedLine, the network through which U.S. financial institutions connect to the Fed for services such as wire transfers, automated clearinghouse transactions, and cash processing. Chicago Fed staff also manage relationships with these banks and oversee the system's in industry relations function which facilitates industry engagement and collaboration on payments. One key lesson I take from payments innovation at the time of the Fed's founding is that the pace of change can be unpredictable. Rarely does a single invention result in sweeping reform. Instead, major productivity improvements in economic history have been driven by the accumulation of incremental changes with their adoption shaped by compatibility with existing practices. The telegraph, for example, certainly existed before the Fed. However, its use in payments was limited by the high fixed cost of operating a nationwide telegraph network, as well as the inability of private banks to impose consistent operating standards. The Fed played an important role in shaping the adoption of payments technology, in this case, the telegraph, in part by creating an appropriate institutional setting for it to be adopted. The payment system has evolved considerably since the age of the telegraph, alongside improvements in communications and computing. Today, payments are an active area of innovation, one part of the broad umbrella known as fintech. I would like to turn my attention now to a few recent developments in fintech. I'll focus in particular on cryptocurrencies and then come back to the subject of payments and discuss the FedNow initiative. Cryptocurrencies have blossomed over the past decade. Since the introduction of Bitcoin in 2008, investors have purchased thousands of such currencies. Today, the market capitalization of all digital currencies is estimated to be over $200 billion. It's clear that there's an appetite for cryptocurrency. For some, cryptocurrencies represent a potential break from established banking and payments infrastructure. Other users value anonymity and therefore the ability to conceal their identities in cryptocurrency transactions. Merchants may be attracted by opportunities to avoid costs incurred with existing payment options, such as interchange fees and debit and credit card transactions. Many others are simply speculating on the value of these cryptocurrencies. The policy implications of cryptocurrencies are fascinating and evolving, and as an asset in the global financial system, cryptocurrencies seem to be still a fairly small development. As a means of payment, the potential use of cryptocurrencies could have important implications for the financial system and for monetary policy, if a significant share of payments activity shifted into cryptocurrencies. In such a scenario, the business models of commercial banks could come under significant pressure. In addition, it's an open question whether significant use of private digital currencies could alter the ability of the Federal Reserve to implement monetary policy through its existing toolkit. Thus far, however, cryptocurrencies have largely been used as vehicles for speculation rather than as a means of payment. For these digital currencies to have more far wide-reaching effects on the macroeconomy, they would likely have to overcome some barriers to adoption. 
One such barrier is the instability of their values. For example, the price of Bitcoin was roughly $3,500 at the beginning of 2019, over $13,000 in June, and as of last week, back down to around $9,000. In addition, transaction speeds have been slow. A Bitcoin transaction could take anywhere from minutes to over an hour. The line at Starbucks would move even more slowly if we had to wait for that. <laughs> Some scholars doubt that a privately issued currency can ever serve as a reliable means of exchange given these factors, together with the inherent default risk associated with the absence of any government or institutional backing. These barriers illustrate a theme I touched on a few minutes ago, that innovation often occurs through incremental changes that are shaped by the compatibility of new ideas with existing ones. Blockchain and digital currencies constitute a major single, single invention, but one with some barriers to adoption that subsequent innovators have been attempting to address in a myriad of ways. Among the thousands of cryptocurrencies, the banana coin, for example, doesn't seem ripe for a breakthrough. <laughs> but others that are geared toward uh, addressing some of the key barriers to wider adoption that I just mentioned may have more promise. This brings me to a second development, the emergence of stable coins. That is, cryptocurrencies that peg their value to target the price of a real world asset. These currencies are designed to address the price stability shortcomings that have inhibited the wider adoption of digital currencies for use cases that require a stable medium of exchange, such as payments. Still, no stable coin offers the network breadth that would be necessary to function as a medium of exchange. This, in part, has been why Facebook's announcement of plans to create the cryptocurrency Libra has gathered widespread attention. With a network of almost 2.5 billion active monthly users and growing, Facebook would potentially provide Libra with a huge user base. But legislators, regulators, and central bankers have been quick to highlight the risks, along with the need for more details about how Libra will function. It is critical to assess Libra's potential impact on users and the financial system, as well as how it can be effectively regulated on a global scale. Facebook's past missteps on user privacy and security raise serious questions about user protection. Central banks have called for more clarity over how the underlying Libra reserve will function and what the makeup of currencies backing the value of Libra will be. In his July 2019 testimony to the House Financial Services Committee, Fed Chair Jay Powell highlighted the Fed's concerns over Libra, particularly around consumer privacy and protection the risks of money laundering, and the need to assess its impact on broader financial stability. With this increase in unfavorable regulatory and congressional attention, the Libra Association, the group founded to fund Libra and provide oversight over it, has seen an exodus of original founding partners, including PayPal, Visa, and MasterCard. Thus far, digital currency innovation has largely been the product of private sector efforts, a central bank digital currency could conceivably address some of the barriers to widespread use that I noted earlier. A central bank's nationwide reach could spur widespread adoption and government backing could ensure the currency would be default free. A small number of central banks around the world have experimented with issuing digital currencies, particularly for the purpose of cross-border payments. Despite these experiments, few central banks have immediate plans for broad implementation. Likewise, the Federal Reserve is not actively considering issuing a digital currency, but continues to monitor other central banks and engage with them to remain current on issues and plans. Some scholars have suggested that a central bank digital currency could provide additional tools for central bankers' toolkits. In particular, new tools could be useful in situations where conventional monetary policy has been exhausted and short-term interest rates have reached the effective lower bound. For example, a central bank could conceivably impose a negative interest rate on the digital currency or carry out a metaphorical helicopter drop of new money to uh, existing holders of, of the digital currency. Such tools raise some immediate questions, such as how a central bank would manage outflows from the digital currency in the presence of negative rates. These questions are 
in addition to the profound operational and technical challenges that any central bank would need to address in launching a digital currency, as well as other concerns such as how existing financial institutions would be affected by such currency. Outside of digital currencies, blockchain technology has other potential uses. For example, blockchain is gaining traction as a means of tracking inventory or provenance. For example, blockchain has enabled suppliers and retailers to track products like milk and meat from origin to consumers, in other words, from farm to fork. In addition, global banks and groups of private firms are testing the technology and its capacity to allow for group monitoring and public tracking of contractual agreements, also known as smart contracts. Thus far, however, the use of blockchain to trade financial information and assets has been largely limited to pilot experiments whose participation is strictly limited, such as Chase's network in which a small number of corporate client clients can transfer funds between each other using the JPM coin. Large decentralized or permissionless public blockchains face implementation and regulatory barriers as well as challenges in scaling up. They also require a high bar for data privacy and protection. Of course, cryptocurrencies are not the only fintech development shaping payments, banking, regulation, and the financial ecosystem. Artificial intelligence with its capabilities for pattern recognition and prediction is being used for a host of processes and tasks in finance and banking. Banks and technology firms deploy AI for monitoring fraud, identifying breach points, and automating customer support tools. Additionally, AI has the potential to automate regulatory and compliance activities while incorporating more data for both regulators and regulated institutions. At the Chicago Fed, we are exploring AI projects to support core work in economic research, bank supervision, and internal business processes similar to the ways banks and their technology vendors are exploring the use of AI to gain efficiency and new insights. While artificial intelligence and machine learning can introduce efficiencies, this is an area where caution and a clear understanding of the risks are critical. Given that tasks such as underwriting and credit scoring rely on broader sets of data and algorithms to support lending decisions, financial institutions will need to frequently examine the impact of this approach. Responsible AI fundamentals are necessary to ensure that unintended bias that could have an adverse effect on borrowers and access to credit is addressed. So I'd like to shift gears now and turn to current plans for innovation in the U.S. payment system. Here I see the Federal Reserve as a leader in promoting innovation both to speed up payments and to ensure resiliency of the U.S. payment system. Even with all the advances in computing and communications technologies over the past few decades, the U.S. payment system still relies heavily on decades-old infrastructure. Indeed, real-time payments are generally unavailable in the U.S. As a result, a bill payment made by a consumer online can still take multiple days to post and settle. It doesn't have to take the 1,500 miles that that poor check did back in 1912, but uh, it can take longer than it should. Contract workers who are not part of a regular payroll could face delays in collecting their wages. Real-time payments offer the potential for people to gain access to money they earned immediately. For liquidity-constrained households, access to real-time payments could mean avoiding late fees, as well as potentially faster access to ad hoc payments like insurance payouts. For small businesses, immediate access to funds from a sale would provide the ability to invest in inventory more quickly avoiding costly short-term financing. For contract workers, having immediate access and certainty of funds provides predictability and reduces risks. The demand for faster payments and the possibility of increasing efficiency with such payments have inspired innovation by private actors. However, these innovations still rely on legacy infrastructure that involves delays. Whether those delays are visible to end users or not. For example, popular person-to-person -person payment services such as Venmo and Zelle, actually mask back-end processes. As a result, even as funds may be available immediately, interbank settlement can take days. Many cryptocurrency trades also often rely on existing settlement infrastructure. Moreover, current innovations have had only limited reach. Checks often remain a desirable method of choice because they carry some enduring advantages for businesses and households that want to track their spending 
or include identifying information along with a payment, such as a purchase order number. In August, the Federal Reserve announced plans to develop the FedNow service, a new round-the-clock real-time payment and settlement service. FedNow will be accessible to all financial institutions and will leverage the Federal Reserve System's connections with over 10,000 financial institutions across the United States. This is a reach no single private sector provider would be able to achieve on its own. The goal of FedNow is to ensure efficiency and resiliency and broaden reach while operating in healthy competition with private sector providers of real-time payments. The Fed's participation in real-time payments will ensure redundancy and reduce the risk of a single point of failure and will also allow us to continue to serve the important role of providing liquidity and operational continuity in times of stress in real-time payments. The move to faster payments has been a global goal. Other central banks and jurisdictions are in varying stages of development and market adoption of faster payment services. The U.S. has avoided mandates primarily because of the size of our economy, our banking infrastructure, and our market-driven system for financial services. Instead, the U.S. has largely relied upon market-driven innovation and joint public-private collaboration to deliver advancements in payment services. The decision to build Fed now has been several years in the making and is a culmination of extensive industry engagement, market assessment, and dialogue with a diverse range of stakeholders. In 2015, the Federal Reserve released a paper titled Strategies for Improving the U.S. Payment System. This paper outlined the Fed's broad commitment to modernizing the U.S. payment system. It also described the industry's desire to achieve positive outcomes involving faster payment speed, system security, improvement in international payments, industry collaboration, and payment system efficiency. The Federal Reserve then led an effort to bring stakeholders in the payment system together to establish a vision for a faster payment system in the United States. The Faster Payments Task Force included a wide range of payment system stakeholders, including providers, banks, consumer groups, corporations, and others, Task Force finalized their work in 2017. It issued 10 recommended actions intended to deliver a safe, ubiquitous, faster payment ecosystem facilitated through industry-driven governance and collaboration. Two of these recommendations focused on the Fed's role in faster payments. The first called for the Federal Reserve to expand settlement windows to 24-7, and the second called on the Fed to assess other operational roles it may need to take to support the ubiquity of faster payments, competition in delivering them, and equitable access to them. As a result of these recommendations, the Federal Reserve conducted extensive outreach and sought public feedback on the potential to expand the Fed's role as an operator of real-time payments. A Federal Register notice requesting comments on the potential introduction of a faster payment settlement service generated over 400 responses representing 800 entities. Over 90% of those responses indicated support for the Fed offering a settlement service for faster payments. Responses highlighted the importance of safety and security in faster payments, noting the Fed's record of resiliency, especially during periods of stress. Another theme from the comments was that the Fed would ensure nationwide equitable access to banks of all sizes by operating a real-time service for faster payments alongside a private sector system. And finally, comments noted that a Federal Reserve real-time payment service would increase competition, decrease market concentration, and provide a neutral platform for innovation. The announcement of the FedNow service followed a close review of these supportive comments. In addition, the Fed gave careful consideration to the broad public benefit of faster payments, the Fed's ability to fully recover costs, and whether the private sector on its own could achieve faster payments with adequate scope, equity, and effectiveness. Real-time payments aren't about speed alone. The payment system must also be resilient in the face of financial stress. Central banks are a classic source of such resiliency. For example, as a lender of last resort, the Fed has the unique capacity to expand total liquidity in the financial system. This is crucial in times of stress when the overall demand for liquidity increases. The history of payments is filled with examples of private sector innovation, but also with examples of the fragility 
of privately run payment systems. For example, scholars have found that one source of fragility during the Great Depression was the privately run correspondent banking system. That is, the system used mostly by non-Fed member banks to clear payments. The failure of a correspondent bank during the Great Depression resulted in a cascade of additional failures among its partner banks, known as respondents. Another example comes from the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Communications interruptions in lower Manhattan led to disruption in payment flows. Sometimes fragility is more idiosyncratic. One well-known example is a computer failure in 1985 at a large New York bank, which has a central role in clearing transactions among financial institutions. The computer failure resulted in the inability of the Bank of New York Mellon to receive any payments, leading to knock-on disruptions in the securities markets in which it had a larger role. In the face of potential disruptions such as these to private real-time payment systems, the FedNow platform will provide an important source of redundancy and resiliency. By ensuring the system is secure and resilient, FedNow will engender confidence in the use of real-time payments. So in conclusion, financial technology has come a long way since checks journeyed hundreds of miles around the country, around the counties. Central banks have had an important role in promoting this innovation, and indeed the Fed continues to innovate alongside private sector actors. These are exciting times, and I look forward to seeing what the future will bring. I wish everyone uh, the best success for a good conference and discussion here. And uh, thanks for your attention, and I'm uh, willing to take a few questions. Yeah, Brian, uh, please wait for the microphone. And <coughs> also say your name and affiliation uh, before you ask questions. Brian Knight from the Mercatus Center at George Mason. Uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for the, the, the great remarks. Um, on the, uh, in terms of modernizing the payment system, I want to ask if, there, if the Fed is giving any consideration to opening the payment system to non-bank payments providers. You mentioned PayPal and, and Square, and they have to have a bank partner to access the system even though there's no real technological reason why that needs to be. So I'm just curious if, as part of your modernization considerations, you're thinking about, about that, w with the understanding that there's probably also a statutory bar, but the Fed being open to it is going to make it much more likely Congress is willing to change it, rather than the Fed being opposed to it. I, I think that's a very good question. Um, you're putting your finger on you know, some of the issues about innovation in uh, the financial industry and payments aren't just about banks and uh, the banking system. It is the case that the Federal Reserve, though, basically our, our purview is working with depository institutions who have access to Fed accounts, and that's uh, what our payment system is going to be based upon. But it is uh, part of those um, uh, 400 comments from 800 entities that we received. Many of them were uh, non-financial institutions on the retail side, large uh, providers who we're uh, looking for greater competition uh, to begin with and uh, perhaps along exactly the lines that you're talking about, access to uh, that vehicle. It's our intention that uh, our Fed now is going to, uh, payment real-time payment system is going to provide a, a platform for other innovators to put their own app on top of, but as you point out, it's going to have to be through a financial institution as it's uh, currently envisioned. Uh, it probably would take a, a change in legislation, but uh, I think that that would be an interesting uh, issue to, to, to investigate. We have to think uh, more broadly about the payment system and all of the players in this new digital environment. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Klein, Brookings Institution. Have you guys done any research on how many billions of dollars each year of delay in implementing real-time payments cost low-income consumers in overdraft, check cashing, and payday lending? Uh, I know it's five to seven years before FedNow comes online. How much is that going to cost low-income people working paycheck to paycheck, one? Two, as a bank regulator of small banks who have become increasingly reliant on overdraft income, how much overdraft income do you expect small banks to lose when FedNow comes into play? And is that reduction in income driving any of the delay of adoption? Oh, 
those are good questions. I think uh, the focus on uh, the consumer side of this and low and moderate income individuals is entirely right to raise those issues. We have certainly uh, pointed to the possibilities that somebody anticipating that they should have made a payment, scheduled a payment earlier or didn't have the funds to make the payment until just now won't be able to make the payment on time and then they could incur a late fee. And so uh, a uh, pay real time payment system like this. Um, can help uh, alleviate that and reduce it. I'm not aware of any studies that have uh, tried to size the uh, losses associated with that. Okay, that's great. I think that's uh, great research that uh, we should all look forward to. Um, you know, there are many different elements. I mean, so, uh, you know, speaking, you know, speaking as a, you know, interested consumer in that type of research and as, as an economist, um, you know, there is an issue as to what the appetite is for real-time payments, and uh, it's usually of the variety, like uh, my son when he was in college on a Thursday night who would send me a text message saying that he was short of funds and he needed something, and the ACH mechanism for which I would send it to him wasn't going to deliver funds until Tuesday morning probably, that so, you know, he could get them uh, more quickly. For anything that could be scheduled, though, of course, you know, you could just schedule it and it could be there. But when your source of uh, income is, I work today to make a payment for tomorrow, then that really does uh, improve things. So I, I look forward to hearing more uh, about that. I think it's very important to maintain the focus on consumers and the welfare of everybody, but low and moderate income individuals. And um, you know, how they end up paying, you know, um, you know, fees for, you know, services and, you know, if we could provide uh, more that would help them out, that'd be great. Any more questions? So, um, maybe I'll ask you one, one question. What do you think about the U.S. Uh, issuing CBDC? Uh, what is the potential? Central bank digital currency. Central, right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that's interesting. You know, in the, in the prepared remarks uh, that I gave, one thing that was uh, noted was this would be an opportunity for policymakers to implement negative interest rates if that was viewed as a, a useful addition to the monetary policy toolkit. I, I don't know that there are many f uh, folks in the U.S. who see that as uh, well. I mean, there's an active debate. Uh, Ken Rogoff obviously has talked about. Uh, uh, getting rid of cash and moving to a digital type of situation like that, and you could actually embark upon uh, negative interest rates. That would serve a purpose in terms of monetary policy, but it would sort of distort other types of payment mechanisms. And so I think we need to, to, to look at those issues, understand them very carefully. Uh, along the lines of consumers and how they would use it, I kind of wonder who would actually have access to that type of currency. I think there's a large number of people who are always going to have a desire for cash because that's the nature of their, um, you know, payment mechanism. And I wouldn't necessarily, I would, it would take quite a lot in order to think about displacing their access to that and making sure that they had the means of using the digital payments at uh, some very low cost fashion. So I think there are a whole host of issues that need to be addressed there. Anyone else? Well, it sounds like everybody's excited to jump into the next panel. Um, so, so let me thank everybody for their attention and. Uh, <laughs>